We're in John chapter 19. We'll be looking at verses 12 through 16a. As I told you, it is a somber passage this morning. Because of the Christmas story in the book of Luke, the one that we're so used to reading each Christmas, many are familiar with the name of the Caesar who ruled while Jesus was a baby. In fact, when Jesus was born, this Caesar was in power. For those of you who have that Christmas story memorized from the King James Version as a child, you know that this was the Caesar who decided that all the world should be taxed or registered for the purpose of taxation. This Caesar that you you know well is the grandnephew and the adopted son of Julius Caesar, perhaps the most well-known Caesar of all. But that familiar Christmas story passage is found in the Gospel of Luke and chapter 2. And in verse 1, some of the first words we read are the name of the Caesar when Jesus was born, Caesar Augustus. But there's a lesser known Caesar. A Caesar you might know, but he's not in the Christmas story. He is found, though, in the Gospel of Luke, and actually he's found exactly one chapter later, not in chapter 2, but in chapter 3 and verse 1. This Caesar is named alongside the man that we've looked at so often, Pontius Pilate, but also named among John, the Levite Baptist. Setting the stage in Luke chapter 3 and verse 1 for John, the Levite Baptist, to prepare the way of the Lord. This lesser known Caesar, who some of you may already know, came to power in the year of Jesus' 18th birthday. This lesser known Caesar stayed in power throughout the entirety of Jesus' earthly ministry, his crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and the very beginning of the fledgling church. This Caesar's name is Tiberius. Tiberius Caesar. There was a Roman author who lived contemporarily with Tiberius at the same time that Tiberius was reigning. This author went by the name Pliny the Elder, and he wrote of Tiberius that he was, quote, the gloomiest of men. There are many reasons that contribute to Tiberius Caesar's gloominess, but one of which is in the ninth year of Tiberius' reign, his son Drusus died. Tiberius Caesar was so grief-stricken that three years later in AD 26, Tiberius left Rome for a city called Capri. He no longer wanted to rule the empire. And so he left the authority and the keys to Rome in the hands of a praetorian prefect named Sejanus. Tiberius lived for the next several years outside of Rome in the city of Capri, indulging in every form of sinful debauchery that you could imagine. And during the time of his hiatus, Sejanus gained so much power and authority, and the people so feared him that four years later, and pay attention to this date, in A.D. 31, suspecting Sejanus of treason, Tiberius Caesar returned to execute Sejanus and his followers. You say, how does this history lesson relate to the passage? Well, at Gospel Fellowship, we believe not only in expository, exegetical preaching where we draw out the meaning of the author's intent, but in order to do that, we understand that we ought to preach from a historical, grammatical approach to Scripture, understanding the time period in which the text was going on and the grammar that the original languages use. And the reason this story relates to our passage today is because Sejanus had a contemporary. In fact, in the very first year that Sejanus came to power, so did Pontius Pilate. Some sources say that Pontius Pilate was a friend of Sejanus, that Sejanus actually mentored Pontius Pilate. And so in AD 31, mind you, during the ministry of Jesus Christ. Pilate may have feared for his own life when Sejanus and his followers were executed. And so today, 
in John 19, two years after the execution of Sejanus. We stand with a bird's eye view of Pilate's trial of another insurrectionist, Jesus of Nazareth. Caesar, the king of the world, will today, two years after his friend's execution, strike fear into Pilate's heart. Because the Jews will pledge allegiance to King Tiberius and make a threat in today's text that so terrifies Pilate that his actions change based on the fact that he may face the same end as his friend Sejanus. And so we'll watch today as disloyalty ensues and the question for us is simple. Where do your loyalties lie? Where do your loyalties lie? We'll watch the sad state of affairs in these few verses as the Jews reject their king in favor of Tiberius. There is a famous phrase that they speak in this text. We have no king but Caesar. And as I poured over this passage of scripture, as Jesus is presented in mockery as king, as Pilate runs cowardly in fear, and as the Jews reject their king, May we be convinced that we have no king but Jesus. So be loyal to him. The title of the sermon this morning is The Threat in the Thick of It. Would you look with me please at verse 12 of John chapter 19. From then on Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Well, in the beginning of verse 12, we read that Caesar, from then on, tried to release Jesus. He tried multiple times. But why? Why from then on did Pilate try to release Jesus? Well, if you'll remember from last time, it was verse 11, and the statement that Jesus made to Pilate. Pilate, you would have no authority at all unless it were given to you from above. From then on, Pilate sought to release Jesus. There was some inkling of truth in that statement in Pilate's mind. Pilate not only knew that this man was innocent of the charge of insurrection, but that there was also something different about him. For Pilate knew the truth, even after asking what is truth, that he would have no authority unless it were given to him from above. Luke chapter 23 and verse 20 records the final attempt that Pilate made to release Jesus. Luke 23, 20, Pilate addressed them once more desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate's first plan had failed, the Barabbas blunder. They chose Barabbas. His second plan failed. We'll punish Jesus, we'll whip him in the back, and then the crowd will have pity on him, but they didn't, they cried louder. And now Pilate is a man without a plan. He has an angry mob facing him that are just becoming more angry. And now, in verse 12, the mob is going to get what they want. For what they have just said to Pilate is an implied threat. You are not Caesar's friend. This is what they accused Jesus of in Luke 23, verse 2. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. 
And so the Jews feign loyalty to Tiberius. Emperor Tiberius. What is the implication if you are not Caesar's friend? The implication is that you are Caesar's enemy. Jesus in the Gospel of John said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. In other words, if you do not do what I command you, you are not my friend. You are my enemy. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30, Jesus said, whoever is not with me is against me. And so the implied threat to Pilate from the Jews, you are not a friend of Caesar. You are his enemy. For this man opposes Caesar. See, Caesar was the king of the world. Caesar was the king of the world, seeking to conquer the world for Rome. And if you oppose Caesar, friend, in that time period, if you oppose Caesar, like there were no placards that you can go stand on a street corner and oppose Caesar. You oppose Caesar, you're dead meat. And so what's going through Pilate's mind here? You are not a friend of Caesar. You know what's going through his mind? A.D. 31. Sejanus. Executed along with his followers. Essentially, the Jews have just said, Pilate, if you don't crucify Jesus, we will send a delegation to Rome and we will tell Tiberius that there is a man in Jerusalem who teaches us to refuse to give tribute to Caesar and calls himself a king. And you know who won't do anything about it? Sejanus' friend, Pilate. That's the threat. And so where do our loyalties lie? Why are we disloyal, friends? And we see the first reason that we are disloyal to our king, the fear of man. Verse 13. So, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the stone pavement and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Friends, we have arrived at the official judgment of our Savior. Pilate did not respond to the threat out loud. But silently, Pilate knows he is bested. And he knows that to avoid execution from Tiberius, his only option is to head to Gabbatha. Jesus was brought outside because the Jews, so that they could observe the Passover, would not go in. And we arrive, friends, in verse 13 at the great and sorrowful irony of the judgment of Jesus Christ. We know well the judgment of Jesus Christ on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me as Jesus becomes sin for us Jesus, who knew no sin, that we who know sin, who do sin, might become the righteousness of God in him. And that is God's judgment on the cross, but here before us is man's judgment of Jesus. And the ironic part is that in John 5, 22, Jesus said, for the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Jesus judged of man. His creation, judging the king. If only they knew that this man standing before them would one day return with judgment in his hands. And so Pilate sits down to announce his verdict. But before he does, he has a spiteful twist planned. Verse 14. Now it was the day of preparation 
of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. Why would Caesar, or Pilate rather, say this? He had already tried it once. Behold the man. Thinking that he would receive pity from the crowd so that he could release Jesus, this innocent man. Certainly, he does not believe there will be any pity left for Jesus. So why, in front of this angry mob, does he say, behold your king? Well, just like anyone who's in charge but not, he's angry. Because he's in charge of Judea. And so he makes a defiant comment to the Jews. Knowing what he must do, crucify Jesus, but he will spite the Jews in the process. Mocking them. Even next week we will see as he hangs a sign upon the cross, the king of the Jews, in a final act of spite to this Jewish nation. And yet memorializing for all time the truth that Jesus is indeed the king of the Jews. But even more than that, Pilate says, behold your king, because he despises the hypocrisy of the Jews. Here they speak of being Caesar's friend, and yet Pilate knows they don't pledge allegiance to Caesar. They never have. Here is their king. Behold Your king highlights the kingship of Jesus Christ even as we sang this morning. O worship the king, all glorious above. The mockery of worship in this title will live on in the word of God. And on the cross, Jesus will speak the words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Pilate had no idea what he was saying. He had no idea of the depths of the sorrowful irony of his statement. Behold your king. Forgive them. They know not what they do. John tells us here in verse 14 that it was the day of preparation. We know that this was a Friday. John records that it was the preparation of the Passover and so one might be led to think that this was perhaps a Thursday or a Wednesday. But rather, John is referring to a special Passover Sabbath on the Saturday and we know this because Mark 15 and verse 42 says, and when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath. Luke 23 and verse 54 also echoes those words. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. And so we find ourselves on a Friday. But also in verse 14, John the son of Zebedee gives us the details of the time, though it is an approximation. It was about the sixth hour. The sixth hour would be from 6 a.m., so about noon around noon. Now you say, why does John add those details in here? It was the day of preparation in about the sixth hour. There are no useless details in the word of God. There was an event that took place around noon on the day of preparation before the Sabbath. And this event could not take place the next day. In fact, it could not take place as of 6 p.m. that very evening. The event that was going on, uh, perhaps as Jesus stood at Gabbatha on the stone pavement, ready to be judged of men, was the slaughter of thousands of lambs in the temple. Tens of thousands of Jewish pilgrims came from all over the world to Jerusalem and the priests had a very busy job during that week. Oh, 
Oh, the irony. As the lambs are slaughtered, sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifices, blood spilling out in mass onto the ground. the priest's hands bloodied with the foreshadowing of the cross, the foreshadowing of the perfect lamb as Jesus stands at Gabbatha, ready to be judged and die as the perfect lamb in our place. Now it was the day of preparation. Behold your king. Well, friends, the Jews, they responded about like you would expect, verse 15. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests, the chief priests, The chief priests answer, we have no king but Caesar. Oh, there was no stopping the mob. But Pilate in his anger and contemptuous spirit and spite lashes out once more. Shall I crucify your king? Where do your loyalties lie? What causes us to be disloyal? Fear of man is one, but we see the second and third reasons that we are disloyal, friends, right here in verse 15. No king but Caesar. What a loaded statement that is. Do you realize that what the Jews have just spoken is a threefold rejection? First, they are rejecting the man, Jesus. they are also rejecting any coming Messiah at all. We have no king but Caesar. As one writer said, this is the formal abdication of the messianic hope, end quote. But thirdly, friends, the Jews in that statement are rejecting Yahweh as their king. This was a blatantly false statement. We have no king but Caesar. Psalm 47 and verse 6. They sing it. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a song. In the synagogues, the Jews would open the scroll of Isaiah and when they arrived at chapter six, would read verse one, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. When they arrive at verse five, Isaiah concludes, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Psalm 29 and verse 10, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as King forever. We have no king but Caesar. Blasphemy. Rejecting their Yahweh, their coming Messiah as king. But you know what? They were right. God was not their king. They did not honor him or worship him. And so I ask you, why do we become disloyal to our God? Why each day do we sin against him? Because, friends, we deny him as our king. It is the very same reason for the Jews here. We deny him as our king. And each time we deny Jesus as our king, we sin. But secondly, Not only do we deny him, we put another king in his place. In the Jews' case, 
it was Tiberius. In our case, though we may never say we have no king but Caesar, what we tell God when we sin is this. We have no king but me. This past Monday, we had youth group at my home at 7 p.m. We asked the question, what does the word hallelujah mean? Many of you know the answer to that. It means praise the Lord. Praise Yahweh. There was another event that went on in Israel right around the day of preparation for the Passover. It was a beautiful event. It happened during the Feast of Booths, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, during the Feast of Passover, and it was singing. But it was a special kind of singing. It was a beautiful choir of Jews singing a song called the Hallel. Hallel is the first part of the word hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallel means praise. The Hallel was a specific set of psalms. It was Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. In fact, when Jesus sang a hymn at the conclusion of the Last Supper, quite likely he sang a portion of the Hallel with his disciples. But when the Jewish choir concludes the singing of the Hallel, it does not conclude with the end of Psalm 118. It in fact concludes with a prayer that is not part of Scripture. The prayer goes like this. From everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Beside thee we have no king. Redeemer or savior. No liberator. Deliverer provider none who takes pity in every time of distress or trouble we have no king but thee Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 13 spoke these words O Lord our God other lords Besides you have ruled over us. But your name alone we bring to remembrance. Hundreds of years of prophetic silence went on between Isaiah's words and our scene today in AD 33. And so Israel waited and waited while other lords, Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus and Tiberius Caesar ruled over them but your name alone we bring to remembrance until they were met with the meek and humble man from Nazareth who was the king they didn't want. And so they defy their God. We have no king but Caesar. Treason. And friends, it is at this moment that the angry, defiant Pilate, in fear of Tiberius, gives in. Verse 16. So, he delivered him over to them to be crucified. John, the son of Zebedee, only records that short sentence. Each of the gospel writers record the delivering over of Jesus. Matthew in Matthew 27, 26 says it like this. Then he released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Mark records it like this in chapter 15 and verse 15. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Luke records it like this in chapter 23 and verse 25. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Why did Pilate do it? 
Why? Why did Pilate do it? Each of the gospel writers tells us why. Luke 23 and verse 23 said that because of their loud voices. Mark 15 and 15 says, wishing to satisfy the crowd. And Matthew 27 and verse 24 says he thought a riot would ensue. Matthew records for us an event that took place as Pilate handed Jesus over. Pilate attempts to remove all guilt from his hands. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 24 we read, So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And friends, after speaking the words, we have no king but Caesar in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 25, and all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Oh, it is. And friend, it's on you and me. And so the sad story, Peter's words in his sermon in Acts chapter 3 and verse 13, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. I wish I knew every heart in this room. I wish I could see into your heart because then I would pursue you. But I can't. I don't know the heart of every individual in here this morning. I believe that most, I hope that all, have come to God and turned from your sin and self-rule, self-kingship and believed in Jesus Christ for your salvation. I hope that. But statistically speaking, I know it's not true. Not with everyone. And so each Lord's Day I call you. Are you rejecting this king? who stands before your eyes on Gabbatha. Are you the king of your life? Oh friend, we have not reached the conclusion of the Bible, but we know that each individual, every single individual, who will not bow before the king of the universe, Jesus Christ, and declare him as Lord, will one day be removed from your self-appointed throne and will be condemned forever to a place called Gehenna, which is the lake of fire, where the devil and his angels and you will be tormented for all of eternity. And if you think I am scaring you into salvation, God is. Because he will judge the world in righteousness and justice. And yet he calls to you even as he called to Pilate. Lay down your sin and self-rule and come to the man Jesus, the God-man, who was judged of man for you. I pray that if that's you this morning, that you would make that decision right now, today that you would believe in Jesus and be saved. And so friends, court adjourned. Now we only need walk the Via Della Rosa to Golgotha to observe as Jesus fulfills the plan from eternity past to suffer the punishment 
that has just been meted out to him by the Jews in Rome. Jesus, guilty, a felon, sentenced to death for blasphemy and treason, hung in the center of two other insurrectionists in Barabbas' band. And we look at this passage and we seem to think, I would have been loyal in that crowd. Would we? This is how we act when we're in the thick of it. We fear men like Pilate. We're cowards. Every day, multiple times a day, I have no king but me. We're blasphemers. And we establish ourselves as king. We are traitors. Ever since Adam and Eve, friends, looked at that horrible tree. Consider its fruit. As the tempter whispered in the ear of Eve, you will be like God. Can I tell you something? Our king was loyal to us. We sang this morning, what love my God would send the way of life to walk the road rejected and despised that you might know friends that Jesus might know the weakness I possess and be my rock of strength and righteousness Jesus was judged at Gabbatha for you and me so that you would not be judged and so I leave you with this Romans 8.1 tells us, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Even as we watched our Savior condemned for us, there is not a drop of condemnation left for you who are in Christ. Jesus was fiercely loyal to his Father and fiercely loyal to his people. We have no king but Jesus, so be loyal to him. Let us pray. Our Father, you sent the way of life, the truth and the life. Oh, Jesus knows the weakness we have. God, you understand all of our weaknesses. You know that we're cowards. And you know that we're blasphemers and you know that we're traitors. You know that every day, multiple times a day, we usurp ourselves onto the throne. We remove you as king and we say we have no king but me. And so would you help us to learn from this text this morning, that even as you were so loyal to your Father and so loyal to us, that we would be equally loyal to you. And though many lords rule over us, may we not do as the Jews did who after 400 years of prophetic silence turned to an earthly ruler. But even as we come to the Lord's Supper today and we remember your death and the judgment of God poured out upon you would we remember that you are coming again and though all the world mock us accuse you of forgetting your promise to us where is the promise of his coming May you help us to stand and firmly believe that you will come again. And oh, we look forward to the day when we will see the Savior judged at Gabbatha face to face. It's in his name we pray. Amen.